Meet Francesco Galli Zucaro, the man behind Aqua Expeditions. Discover his journey, the road bumps along the way with both sunny and dark days, and which specific talents and skills made the difference in the creation of an industry benchmark. Francesco, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I think that everybody's very eager to learn more, not only about Aqua, but in this case, we want to learn more about your story. And I think that one of the amazing um, the amazing journeys that every entrepreneur and every successful businessman goes through has its ups and downs and has its incredible takeaways and learnings. And I would love for you to share a little bit of who is the man behind Aqua Expeditions and how did you come about to enter this incredible story of Aqua Expeditions? Thanks, Tina. Uh, first of all, I feel very privileged to have had FaceTime with you twice in the last six months. So, uh, and, and congrats to you for uh, keeping, keeping, uh, you know, this entire industry uh, wide awake at all hours of the day. And, uh, and so thanks. And I think uh, your passion, your, your perseverance, your smile goes a lot further than just uh, what you've accomplished with uh, TL Portfolio. So, um, you know, you. I'm a big fan. Let's see, whatever takeaways today gives, hopefully it comes from what you see is what you get. There's no big mystery here. By no means do I claim to have done anything that nobody with passion and perseverance can accomplish. I, I guess I was just fortunate enough to identify and find out what I was hopefully good at, but if anything, what I love doing early on. And I think the ones that are lucky enough to have fallen into that path and realize early on where we could, should consider ourselves blessed and, and especially during these last tumultuous months, uh, those are the, that's what gets us out of bed every morning and that's that passion and perseverance and love for what we do that kind of keeps us smiling getting up on those zoom calls then meeting with staff and answering questions to many times you know questions actually we don't know the answers to so um sure. but yeah you know i'm happy to share my story and hopefully find some takeaways for that for the for the audience at large today fantastic and so tell us a little bit about at what point did you decide hmm, river cruising amazon yeah that's that's the thing to do i mean where how did that come about i don't think i'm going to say to obviously a lot of our colleagues and friends that are going to be listening to this in the coming days I think uh, many of them have heard that story, and whilst it hasn't changed, it continues to be true, which uh, I was fortunate enough when, after graduating from school in, in the States and then moving to New York, and it was an era where everybody wanted to interview, everybody wanted to work in investment banking. It was, you know, I'd go weekends from Boston College down, take the train, go to New York for the weekend and try and interview with all the investment banks to become an analyst. To, make it big in the M&A world, right? And, and I did that for about a year and a half. I fell into it well. I worked with a government agency, actually an Italian one, but it was in the investment arena. But um, whilst I loved it, I knew it was, I wasn't cut out for it. Um, I think I enjoyed it for the time period, but all I did was it was a way to fund my round the world trip uh, with my girlfriend then, my wife now. So um, we were lucky enough to, you know, gather up good enough funds to take us a year backpacking around the trip, around the world. And that, I guess, was just that extra little push I needed to make sure that uh, once I started, I wasn't going to turn back as far as exploring this be beautiful world that we have today and that we are lucky enough to promote and sell. To make a long story short, I went to, uh, did a year backpacking, ended up in London, worked in finance again there. But by that time I was engaged, I got married in Quito, Ecuador. And that was the kind of the big leap of, the first big leap of faith I took was quit my, you know, risk management job in London in the city, take a leap of faith, quit, go to, go to Quito, uh, interview. And I started working at a PE fund there, kind of a private equity fund that invested in several sectors. And one of them I fell into was telecom. It was satellite-based distance education, uh, Israeli technology. And I ran that business for about five years. And again, it was working with, with the government sector. It was difficult to really demonstrate your ability to uh, make deals happen because a lot of it is out of your control. And then I kind of took another leap of faith by venturing into the Galapagos and running uh, this commercial arm of Ocean Adventures, which still, till a few years ago, owned the Eclipse, one of the top expedition vessels there in the medium range in the Galapagos. And that was my, my 
my eye opener, you know, what better place to fall in love with tourism and conservation and iconic world sites like the Galapagos Islands than this archipelago of uh, living evolution where you can witness evolution in, 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 in true and, and firsthand. So that was an easy first step. No? But so you call them leap of faith, right? And I think that it's almost, um, you, you had almost an industry shift there, right? You at some point- Massive, you left massive. Massive. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that a lot of our colleagues today are pondering is this is the time to take, to pivot, right? The famous favorite word during COVID is pivoting. What what was your calling? I mean, how what would you say? Because it's a big step. It's a leap, right? You kind of it is. let yourself. It is, I guess, by nature, my appetite for risk is relatively strong. And so I think inevitably, inevitably, you have to have an appetite for a certain amount of risk. But I guess I always tell myself, you know, what's the worst that can happen? I think we're probably in many ways living the worst that could happen to many of the people in the industry, uh, all of us in some way or another, more than others in some way affected. So I think, you know, and that's when you fall back on, you fall back on family. You say, you know what? Okay. You know, I go back and live with my parents or I go back and eat it, bite into my nest egg or my my inheritance or I get in debt when I don't like having debt. So all these are, are depending on that level of risk that you're willing to live with. Uh, yeah, I think I, I welcome that risk to a certain degree. I like that challenge. Uh, a lot of people are risk adverse and so understandably so they need that kind of Ma Maslow's hierarchy, hierarchy of needs to kind of delve into that next step level of, yeah. of risk. So as long as home, you know, food and, and all your basic needs are met, then you can focus. I guess at that phase of my life, I was willing just to, you know, put it all in and, and give it a shot. And that's when I left uh, Aqua Expedition. I, I left Ocean and started Aqua. Uh, and it was at a time when, you know, Ecuador's economy was going to tank because of the political outs uh, foresight of the next five years. Peru's double digit growth was just eyeing everybody. It, had, it was, you know, the, the golden child in Latin America. Peru's double digit growth was just booming economy, tourism. So I thought, okay, let's, let's go to Peru. And I took another leap of faith to go there and go to the Amazon and do everything I did. And, but I, I think what allowed me to really make that reality was conceptualizing and really envisioning uh, what I wanted to create. And I think that's such an important aspect of whatever entrepreneurial dream anybody has that you have to be able to visualize. Whilst there's yeah. this great and a lot of entrepreneurs maybe have failed because they have this build it and they will come mindset. You know, yes, okay, you have to have the dreamers and we're in a certain degree all dreamers as far as entrepreneurs, but I think a lot of it has to be found on solid financial sense. And so I think we struck that balance quite nicely. You know, my partner and my co-founder, Fred, who is a, you know, industry professional, uh, ran Deloitte and Touche for years, helped me build a rock solid business model that supported that decision that you want to, you know, today you want to, I don't know, in South America, entrepreneurs say, okay, I want to turn my family hacienda into a, a beautiful a homestay. Okay, well, that sounds great. And you've got an incredible baseline for a beautiful farm and hacienda, but where is the model that actually supports it? And so, yeah. so many times I've had conversations with people that have this dream, I want to attend this hacienda. And today, probably, yes, having an asset has given us a relevance stronger than anybody out there. Any, anybody who's actually owning the, the product and the inventory is not going to get cut out of the deal, is not going to get circumvented. And so, ha but on the other hand, I have the burden that I've got got fixed operating costs I've got to endure for the last eight months. So there's a balance there. But I know that I'm not going to be obsolete anytime soon because you can, anywhere you go, any booking channel you want to use, you're going to have to end up booking with Aqua to get our cabins. So, but I think all those are things that I kind of checked those boxes and made sure that my dream was supported by strong financials and that financials was eventually funded. And there comes the biggest question, you know, how much are you willing to put in and how much, you know, obviously everybody says, you know, don't start your business with your own money, but if you truly believe in it and you want to put some skin in the game, mm -hmm. then obviously I think it demonstrates to any backer that you're putting not only sweat equity, but you're putting some skin in the game and that demonstrates uh, a true passion and a true belief in what you're doing. So it's all got to match in order for that financing eventually to come, which it did, but it, usually the banks lend you money when you actually don't need the money, right? That's the truth.
um, <laughs> in the, so so all those are kind of drivers that made me get to where I am today with now what's what's an incredible world class team right unbelievable and you mentioned a partnership uh, that you had a, a very good partner um, and I think that I nowadays have, have, you yeah. still you, of course you have a good partner and nowadays there's more than ever there's a lot of talk about collaboration right it was it seemed like yesterday it was all about competition and as of you know the pandemic there's a a movement towards collaboration and i think when people start looking at even agencies and you know start looking at you know what can we do together you know how can we unite how to find a good partner how did you know that this was the right partner first of all he's family because he's my father-in-law so i was blessed to have is. an incredible that does help and that um but it helped because you know whilst having acute business sense uh, also and good business acumen he believed in my business proposal and the two of us went into it wide open, uh, believing in the industry. And obviously, whilst I brought the experience and the know-how and the relationships, and he obviously had that business acumen that also uh, made sure that our rock solid business plan could deliver and had sensitivity built into it that allowed for some sort of all sorts of stress testing, which is what I call in case your assumptions don't work out. And, um, but I, I think at the end of the day, you know, the last few months, yes, you find this, there's, there's a bunch of ways to find after choosing your partner, your husband or wife, this is choosing a partner is probably the second most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Whilst I've been lucky enough to only have to have made it once, the, the PE funds that have come in and out of us over the last 13 years to help fuel our growth have been a good fit. You got to foster those relationships, build on them. They're based on trust, on transparency, on solid business sense. But at the end of the day, they come, they come in and they come out as long as they happily exit, which luckily they have with us um, and, and, and the current ones, uh, same. So I think at the end of the day, really, you know, conversations that have ensued over the past months, even with agents that are say, okay, they've been independent agents, case in point, several, at least three I've had uh, in the past months where they've got the burden of, you know, they've got, they've had the luxury of being their own bosses. They've got a good book of business, but then they've been burdened by the operational costs. And so I would like to think that a lot of the smaller ones, while still very successful, small, they can probably hunker down and, and cut, drop their operating costs to basically minimum as long as yeah. they keep their portfolio of client roster active and engaged. And then they've got to pivot and see, okay, do I want to go and merge with a larger, uh, you know, affiliate agency where, you know, they can give me the overheads, they can give me um, the, the variable costs that are based on transaction and not have the heavy kind of overhead costs that are fixed. I think people are going to be, should be looking now at variable costs in order to find solutions that are variable based on either performance and renegotiate whatever, everything's on the table these days, renegotiate existing relationships. It's got to be win-win. I'm a believer that negoti negotiations have to be win-win. Uh, I'm not in there that comes in really bullish and says, okay, it's my way or the highway. I think you find that balance, but I think there's a lot more empathy now saying, okay, you know, um, let's find variable solutions that give performance-based uh, overheads or merge. Mergers are good things. Mergers are not necessarily bad things. Sometimes you have to ask yourself, do you want to be a bigger, have a bigger stake of something, uh, you know, that's not as profitable or a smaller stake of something much more profitable. And I think people have to go in thinking, I'm going to have to let something go for the greater good down the road. And, and maybe your, your scenario has to be not two, three years, but it has to be four or five years now. So you got to push that. I'm not pushing the can down the road, but you have to be more sensitive that to a certain degree, the world has changed. Uh, our, the resilience of our guests and our travelers is there. And I think we definitely bent up demand, no doubt about it. It's just going to take a while to ramp up again. For sure. For sure. And I think a lot of that has to do with also knowing what your passion, knowing what you're calling, knowing what's your natural talent, right? What do you do well without much effort? When you look back at your story, there's, I think, and, I, and I'm generalizing, but in general, some people, you usually know, well, I'm good at this and that. And when you put yourself in a position of starting a company, you actually surprise yourself. Did you, did you have a moment that, well, I know you probably knew you were a good businessman and that you're, you have a natural tact or a natural uh, charm for the camera and for the PR world, because that's evident in, in your success story. But was there anything else that you said, you know, wow, I didn't know this was my car. I didn't know I'd be so good at that. Or I thought I'd, because I think, once you let, they say, right, once you find what your passion is, you never work a day in your life. And most successful people who enjoy what they're doing, as you said, have that 
a fun element. You know, I wake up in the morning and right. I want to do this because this is what I love to do. And it happens to be my, my profession. Obviously, I think people hopefully can tell that within two minutes of talking and engaging with myself, with, with me, you can easily detect that I have a true passion and it's never dwindled even in the last eight months uh, of what I'm doing and how lucky and blessed I am to do what I am and what I'm doing and with the individuals that we work with and the team I have. Because by no means, while this might have been an entrepreneurial dream 13 years ago, today, it's by no means a one-man show. Today, the company can run I'd like to think very well, 100% without me, but I think I still have some value to add to it. And I'm obviously very hands-on. I think the biggest gratification is that I realize how important it is to actually you know, have something to build. And whilst uh, a lot, we, we can't undermine all the efforts of all our agents and clients out there that are actually building itineraries and building experiences. The fact that I've actually built ships and build them from scratch and have a concept and actually deliver. You know, I, I'm a guy who leads by example. So I, you know, that I've lived in the yards, I've lived in yards for three years building two ships there then in southeast asia and vietnam now in singapore um and so I've, my passion is being in the yard uh, and 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 that's why we've been able to deliver deliver consistently deliver on time and on budget um but it's you know that, that's kind of i i it's I call it synchronicity i'm at the right place at the right time but i create opportunities I, I make things happen. So yes, a lot of it used to be just showing up and traveling, getting on a plane and making meetings happen and convincing clients to book our business and book our ships. But I think it's also convincing a, ta a team of talented individuals to believe in my dream and making sure that, you know, Simon Sinek's, uh, you know, your why, finding your why. I know what my why is, but making sure that my team's why aligns with mine. Because what happens with a business as it grows is that why splits and you have the team's why goes one way and the, and the founder's why goes another way. And so you have to make sure that you have constant checks, checks and balances to then make that sure that that why is synonymous and leads the same way. Because if not, when you have that break and that split, you kind of lose that that ethos and that that true sense of um, of service, right? So we constantly check in with our whys all the time and make sure, hey, is my why your why? Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's at the end, uh, they have somewhat different reasoning, but the the company's why should be one and the same, right? And 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 we do that constantly once a year in our annual meeting. We make sure that we're always in check, no? Um, but it's 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 an incredible journey and one that I'm very proud of. And today I'm more than anything. You know, I've had my dark days. I mean, for anybody who knows the history of Aqua, we've definitely had to endure really difficult yeah. days. And it's during those days that you question, okay, do I throw in the towel or do I face the music? and and plug plug on and go on and this is one of those challenging days for all of us do i wake up and i have an in, innate ability i think luckily because of the support system i have both at home and in the industry like friends like yourself and everybody else is that we're able to kind of clear the two a little bit you know obviously we take our work home but i'm able to also say okay well this is my day-to-day -day responsibility as a, a ceo but also have a role to do to lead a team of professionals and make sure that they're not you having sleepless nights i do have sleepless nights many a nights <laughs> especially in the last six, eight months. But we need to wake up and, and face the music and plug ahead because I, I need to lead and, uh, and I do that happily. And yes, and you do that very well. And one of the things that's, I think, um, been so motivational is that you don't only, you know, keep keep dancing to the music you forge ahead i mean you look at aqua and at no point obviously before but during the pandemic has the the feeling of the ship slowing down i mean it's been you know they might be stopped but the force behind it is as strong as ever um and that's in a way you know what everybody questions where do you get all this this energy and this vision and this commitment because i you know i guess that if you're looking so far ahead this is just a bump on the road. Can you can you tell us a little bit of how you envision yeah, I mean, that? Because uh, it's really for all force, you know, all hands on deck, even though the boat's are. I'm, I'm glad it's conveyed that way and it, it is true, but I get my sense of drive and inspiration from all of you. I mean, whilst you all in the trade community and the agent community and the tour operator community is a force to be reckoned with, 
you guys keep me on my toes because, you know, I'm sitting there and, you know, my, my projects, our boats are labors of love. They take a year to scout the destination, which I do personally. And I go to uh, all over the different parts of the world and scout bodies of the river, be it rivers or bodies of water, be it rivers or coastal cruisers, uh, coastal destinations. Then I design the ships, then we build them and then we start marketing them, right? So they're three-year projects. But by the time I'm just opening for reservations or taking my first guest on board, you know, the agent community is like, okay, what next? I was like, whoa, 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 easy, <laughs> easy, tiger. You know, I just took me three years to deliver this shit. Help me fill this one, then I'll put you another one. So I think, but that constant pressure to deliver, as obviously it's a sign, it's a good sign. I'd like to think that yeah. they wouldn't be asking me what's the next ship if I did an awful job at building, operating, and running them. So luckily, but I take that as a, to a certain degree, I turn that energy into positive energy, not stress, and I go out and build. And yeah, during the last 12 months, you know, the ability for us to say, no, do we put freeze on everything or do I forge ahead and build Aquaneta? I mean, I was in Ho Chi Minh in January, took, took the first steel structure of the Aquaneta, and then never saw it again until about three weeks ago in Singapore, when she happened to luckily come by Singapore because she's a river cruiser, as you remember, and she's destined, she's our new one for the Amazon, but she was heavy lifted onto a cargo ship in Ho Chi Minh. I never saw her get finished. I built her and designed her and executed the building via Zoom with an incredible team on the ground in Ho Chi Minh, luckily, and then saw it for the first time. And now she's, she arrives in Belen, Brazil on the 17th of October, four days from now, after a, you know 11,000 mile nautical, uh, nautical voyage. And so, yeah, we took advantage of this crisis and continue to forge ahead, build her, so that she'll be ready and waiting when borders open and guests can travel again. So, but I think, you know, I could sit here and, you know, cry, uh, on the past and, you know, to get depressed on the days uh, that we live these days, but I have to forge ahead and focus on that recovery. And that what that's what kind of gets all of us through these days, right? Yeah, yeah no, and I think it's one of those things that part, if you, you know? it, no, and, I, and it's, it's, you know, if you think it was hard to build a ship when you could actually have hands on deck and try doing it virtually, I'm sure you never imagined that would be a reality of building a ship on Zoom, you know? No, but also it's a confirmation of how we've been able to empower an incredible group of team and delegate. And as you grow the business, you know, I could have stayed in Peru 10 years ago, eight years ago and built one, two, three ships and successfully stayed in Peru. But I took a big leap of faith again and say, okay, my cash cow is in Peru. I'm moving to Asia and leaving an incredible team that I entrusted to run the business. And then now they've done not only a great team, but also justified growing the business to put another ship there. So that's a confirmation of teamwork, of empowerment, of delegation, and of best practices that now we can grow across, because I went over to grow the business in Asia. So I think you need to take those leaps of faith. You need to surround yourself with talented, positive individuals. And so, you know, to the community at large today, if you've always saw, seen your competitor or someone you thought, wow, that guy does an amazing job, well, pick up the phone and call them up and say, you know what, we're all living through this crazy time. How about, you know, getting our heads, our, you know, thinking cap on and see if we can join forces and some, an incredible agent in LA, an incredible agent in New York, forge together and do something unique. Or, you know, I've had five, 10 agencies in the last months get together and create a powerhouse, a small, it's in early stages of powerhouse of pooling in their marketing efforts or digital efforts. So yes, think outside the box, reach out to your competitive, you respect them and you think that someone's doing something great. Listen, it goes a long way to pick up and show some humbleness. I don't think you have to be, you know, I'm, 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 the humbleness goes a, lot, a long way these days and, and stay humble, but yeah. uh, confident of what you've built and uh, accept, uh, accept uh, partnerships with open arms. And I think one of the, if I had to say one, an, an, add an additional word to your list of uh, why it was a success. And I think there's many to it, but leadership is definitely one of them. Um, and, and that's um, for sure due to your incredible energy and commitment. But if you had to look as a leader, uh, especially now, but always, what is the one ingredient you think a leader cannot do without in good and bad times? What has been your one, if you had to really say, this is my calling. 
Um, I mean, my one, I'd hate to just pigeon toe myself into one of them. I think what I've learned to have, that's one quality that I wouldn't say I've always had. Whilst I'm very driven and I'm very, you know, alpha male, knowing exactly what I want. And I'm not saying that I don't listen, I've got blinders on. But I think empathy is super important, especially these days. So, um, you know, obviously I, 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 you know, I love the book uh, called Grit, which is, you know, about passion and perseverance. I, I instill that upon my kids all the time. And, you know, I've got two kids in college and obviously who would have not, not to anyone's surprise that they want to follow in our footsteps and my footsteps and my wife's footsteps in the business. And we'll see if that is true or not, but at least they're in the hospitality sector, which they want to, and they're extremely good at it. But empathy, I think is more than ever today. Uh, you know, we've, what you see is what you get. So there's no e egos here. There's no space for egos in our, in definitely my company. There's, um, there's, there's gotta be a huge level of transparency in what we do with our guests, you know, with yourselves, with the trade. We've always said what it is. Whenever we've had good days and bad days, you know that uh, you can yeah. come to us and you get the straight story exactly as is. And I think that's super important. So it's, it's, it's a mixture of things. I'd say integrity, but empathy more than ever today because everybody's going through uh, good times and bad times. And to be empathetic to that just allows you to be a lot more approachable, a lot more um, you know, integrated with your team and, and really make them kind of follow behind and, and eventually help lead as well. Yeah, no, that's beautifully put. I think empathy is a signal of trust and longevity. It's if you want to be together with somebody for a long time, then you open yourself up to understand their position as well. But and I want to show you, you show your vulnerability, show, show your vulnerability, vulnerability. as well, which is, you know, human. Yeah, that's the key, right? Looking at our lives and our businesses in a very human manner. Um, Francesco, it's always a pleasure pleasure to chat. I love, I learn from you every time we connect and I can't thank you enough thank for making you, time. You. I know life is busy, um, but it's always a pleasure to, to have a chat. So thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week ahead and uh, here's some more great content. Thank you, Tina. Have a great week. Enjoy the days that you are disconnected from Zoom and uh, keep us forging ahead. So thanks and have a great rest of the week. Okay. Thank ciao you. Ciao, 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 ciao.